Hello, I'm Joe Chamberlain, the Executive Director of the Coastside Land Trust, the host of today's webinar. We have several webinars on our website. They've all been recorded and please uh, don't hesitate to go on and, and view them and read and enjoy them and share them around. A couple of logistics before we start with our presentation. We will be receiving a follow-up email that will include the link to the record today's recording and, and any other pertinent information, any additional questions that you had that we weren't able to get to. And uh, please don't hesitate to also send a donation to us. We are a, a 501c3 nonprofit and funded through private donations and grants from agencies. The uh, speaker we have today is John Muir Laws, and many of you know him. I suspect many of you have a copy of his book on your shelves and are looking forward to the new things he has to share with us. His, he has dedicated his life to helping us see the na natural world through visual and exploration techniques specific to journaling. And nature journaling is such an incredibly rewarding activity and a, a lifetime activity as well. And something that anyone can do. You don't have to be an English reader. You don't have to be a, a Spanish reader or a Japanese reader. You don't have to know the names of the plants and the birds and the, and the fields. You just need to sit and enjoy and, and draw and record in your own way. And John is an expert at this, and he's able to provide us with insights that will broaden and enrich our world. And we're so delighted to have him with us today. And I just learned that he has founded a new organization called Wild Wonder Foundation to facilitate the teaching of nature journaling. And John, could you share a little more about that and some more stuff about yourself, please? I'd be delighted. Uh, well, thank you so much for uh, that lovely introduction and I'm delighted to be with you today. I was just talking to some of the folks in the green room a moment ago about um, why I'm really uh, so excited to be with, with, with uh, Coastside Land Trust today. The reason that I do all this teaching about how to connect with nature and nature journaling, the reason I do all this work to help people um, to learn how to keep their own nature journals is because I believe that through the act of attention, we make a connection with a place through the act of connection of, of attention we make connections with other people think about the role of attention in your relationship with whatever significant partner you may be with or with your child when you so when you put when you close the laptop you put all that stuff away and you say like, like what you know, tell me a little bit more about that like what really what what happened today how did you feel about that that completely changes your relationship with your with 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 your daughter with whoever it is that you're talking to and so it is with nature when we can get ourselves to pay deep attention to a to any phenomenon to to a bird to a place we develop a deeper relationship with that place nature journaling is an incredibly powerful way to pay attention so i believe that attention is love Love is the act of sustained, compassionate attention. Nature journaling is the most powerful tool that I've found to help me pay attention. In other words, nature journaling is my best tool to fall in love with the world around me. And when we, when we deeply love a place or the species within it, we're motivated to stand up to protect those. And that's what the Coastside Land Trust is all about. And uh it's through these acts of attention that we can we motivate ourselves because of our love for a place to do the work to protect and to preserve these places 
And so the relationship between nature journaling and, and land stewardship is really, really strong. Nature journaling is about paying attention. We fall in love with the world. When we fall in love with the world, we're now motivated to protect it. And we can come together in communion with other people who share that love to be able to make a difference. So I'm really glad to be here with you. And I'm going to show you, I want to kind of give you philosophically, right, why I think nature journaling is so cool. And then I'm going to show you practically on paper, what, uh, just sort of kind of what this can look like. And I want to encourage you to give it a try and to start. So this is something that the more you do it, the better it gets. And at the start, a lot of people say like, oh, I'm not an artist. I can't draw. Therefore, I can't do nature drilling. So it's actually not about wanting to dispel that myth. This is not about making pretty pictures. If you start doing this on a regular basis and start practicing it, your pictures will get better and better and better and better and better. And so people who have been doing it a long time, people look at their stuff and they go like, oh, these are pretty pictures. So this must be something about making pretty pictures. No, it's about paying attention. And the pictures that you make are kind of the sidecar that kind of comes along. But the one who's driving it is attention. And in the sidecar, it's like, oh, you're learning how to be an artist. Mm, it's fun for the ride. So what I want to do is I've got, I've got a journal here. And this is, is, is recording all of my... My, my observations and notes about places or phenomenons or things that are growing in my garden. This is, you can think of the nature journal essentially as this is, this is your brain on paper, right? So anything that you observe, you want to put down into this book by any means necessary. And so what might some of those means be? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, so, me, I'm dyslexic, so when I was growing up, I was intimidated about writing. I'm now starting to make friends with words, right? But when I was younger, I was really scared of writing because I thought that all my, 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 my things I write would come back covered with red pen. So my notes started off just being pictures of things. So pictures are a very powerful way. Sketches, diagrams, maps, they don't have to look pretty. But making them makes you look more carefully when you're out there. So the pictures are a part of it. But if this becomes like the only thing that you're focused on, it sort of becomes a fetish. And then you think like, I have to make pretty pictures. No, 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 no. It's about paying attention. And we're just using those pictures to record our observations. So I start with pictures. The part of your brain that handles visual stuff is in the back. There's this part in the front. Ooh, that plays with words and language. So when you are playing with words, you're using different regions of your brain than you are when you're doing pictures. Which one's better? Doesn't matter. They're different. So do them both. And draw without worrying about making pretty pictures. And write without worrying about spelling or grammar. Um, we just want to get our observations, our thoughts, and our feelings, let them into your perceptions, and then get them down on paper. Your paper can hold much more information than, um, than your brain can. Your brain's going to forget this stuff. You think that it's going to, your, your brain's pretty good at remembering, but all the research shows our brains are absolutely terrible. So there's one other language that I use, which is numbers. So I've got, what is it? Words, pictures, and numbers. So I can measure things. I can count things. So you'll see bird watchers going like, how many golden crown sparrows are now out at Wavecrest? And um, when we're quantifying, our brains are working in different ways than when we're using language, than when we're drawing pictures. And if I can get my brain to do all these things, I've essentially made a bigger trampoline for my, 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 my mind to play with. If I'm just doing the pictures, that's a little tiny target, but the big trampoline, is words, pictures, and numbers. So I'm intentionally doing these. And so I'll sometimes use these just to kind of look down on my page and be like, oh, I haven't done any numbers here. Maybe I should count something. Maybe I should record what the temperature is. What other ways can I get those, those, those numbers in? Or, or I haven't been using words. So this is kind of a good reminder. Words, pictures, and numbers, that's sort of practically what it is. Let me now jump over to a, uh, a document camera, and I'm going to show you sort of what this can look like. Oh, hey there, words. All right, so, so here is 
Um, so here's here's an example of a, a, a journal page. Here's looking at a piece of fruit. Here's recording the equinox. Here's looking at at, at planets. Here's 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 looking at going out to, to Moss Landing and and looking at what a, a bunch of little critters are doing. And again, you notice there are words, there are numbers, I'm, and and there are pictures. So I'm using these. But there's one other triad that is really useful to kind of think about, and that is, that's how I'm doing it, but what am I doing? So the first thing that I'm doing is I am recording the observations that I make. So if, if you see something, put it down on paper. And so it starts just with observations. So see it, observe, observe it, put it down, observe it, put it down, observe it, put it down. And, and then, um, as I'm doing that, I start to, to wonder about things. I intentionally try to make myself more curious, and I start to ask questions um, about what I'm seeing. So here, I'm looking at a bunch of elephant seals, um, and I'm wondering, does high tide which limits space on the beach, increase aggressive interactions between individual individuals. So I'm trying to make myself more curious. If I can get myself more curious, my brain will, will engage with this much more. And the third piece is, is there anything else that I have learned or studied or experienced that one way or another ties into what I'm looking at? So I have I do this process that I call I notice I wonder it reminds me of and I'll be demonstrating that in a moment. These three things together with these three things together. That's what nature journaling is: words, pictures, numbers. I notice I wonder it reminds me of. And you take those two pieces, you put them together, and then you press that into the pages of a journal. And then those experiences are with you. All right. Let's imagine for a moment. Just give me a second to change views here. We are going to go to Wavecrest. All right. So <clears throat> um, I'm going to take you on a. Now, where did I put that? journal there I put that journal so I'm bringing a little notebook along with me and I'm going to imagine that I am having an, an experience out there as I am tromping around and um, and I'm going to describe that on the pages of this notebook and just to give you an example of sometimes it, it helps to sort of see how an experience can 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 get onto the page when you look at sort of a, a page in a journal and everything is filled out it sort of feels like some fait accompli that you know this is like how do you how do you even start so let's let's do that let's imagine that we're out at wavecrest we've just pulled out pulled up into that, that little parking area near the softball game uh, and um, maybe there's people doing batting practice, maybe there's a game going on, you find yourself a place to park, and you and your friends who you've carpooled with hop out of the vehicle, and one of the first things that you uh, notice is that in that little grove of, 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 of pines across the way, There are some white birds sitting in the tops of the trees. And you get out your binoculars. I carry binoculars with me. It's a lot of fun. And you go like, oh my gosh, these are these little hawks. There are these little hawks, these little white and gray hawks sitting in the tops of these trees. And it's really fun. You, you watch them. Some of them will go out and they'll hunt for a while over the fields. And they, they sit out there. They just flap their wings. Flutter, 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 flutter. And then they come back to their little perches. And you're thinking, wow, this is really, really fun. So let's use this as an opportunity to do some, some nature journaling. If there's a critter and it's being cooperative and sitting in a perch, we'll do a non-cooperative critter in just a moment. Um, 
and uh, then 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 I'm going to take advantage of the, the the cooperative ones. I'm going to to get myself started. I'm going to put down. I'm in Wavecrest. So it's at Wavecrest, um, and today's date is January 28th. I'm going to put in January 28th. Can't believe it's 2023. How did that happen to a perfectly good 2022? Um, and today it's a little bit overcast, and it's foggy. So I've just put, I, I put this down on my page for two reasons. One is that it's a non-intimidating way just to break in the page. And um, the, if I'm looking at just a blank page, it's sometimes hard to jump into that. But by doing this, there's something on my page already. Now it's gonna be a lot easier for more things to follow along. The other reason I do it is because I'm a scientist. And I know that where I'm seeing something and when it is that I'm seeing it, that context is really useful information for understanding the behavior of these critters. So I call this the metadata and I always try to put this into the start of my, my journal pages. There are times that I've forgotten to do it. Sometimes I'm so excited that I forget to do it. And later on, I'm wondering what day was that? But if I can get in the habit of regularly putting my metadata in, life is better. All right. So now we've got these, these birds that are perched up there in the tree. So I get up my binoculars and I take a look through them. I'm going to show you how I might sort of start to get this down in my notebook. Um, I like to start with a, a, a drawing and I will use a very light pencil stroke with this. Um, well, sometimes I'll use a colored pencil. And on this, I'm going to make a little loose, sketchy drawing of this bird. I, I'm starting here with just sort of the angle behind its back and its head. And I'm going to put in a little ball saying its head is going to be about this big. And then the the chest kind of sticks out from that and down. And you see how that has helped me block in the shape of my bird. So I started with the back, I put in its head is roughly this big, and then it's got chest sticking out about this far. Now there's my body in there. So that gives me, I'm here just now looking at like, if that's, is, does that work for sort of the rough size of this bird? Yeah. Okay. If so, I'm going to continue with just sort of lightly blocking this in. I've got a bunch of wing and back in here. There is more wing that sticks out in a triangle underneath that. And I see a little bit of its white tail. So I find it helps me so much to start a sketch by um, lightly blocking something in. Once I've got that basic shape, then I can start to draw more, more heavy lines on top of that. So here I'm bringing out a ballpoint pen and it's easier to draw from a photograph because the birds don't move. Um, but we'll kind of deal with what to do when the birds do move in, uh, in a little bit. So this one is looking down, so its little beak is down here. It's got this beautiful blood red eye low in its head here. And so I will just make a, I, I've already figured out with my, um, with those purple lines, the basic shape of it. So now I can be just a little bit more careful, a little bit more deliberate as I'm coming in here with my pen. There's this big black section. So this, there's, this is a bird that went through a, a number of different kind of name changes. 
It was first called the white-tailed kite. Then his name was changed to the black-shouldered kite. Then they decided, oh, this one that's over in Europe, maybe that one's different. We're going to change it back to white-tailed kite. So this one, its, it's name has bounced ping-ponged back and forth between white-tailed kite and black-tailed kite. I think it's white-tailed kite now, but give ornithologists a couple more months and we might change the name again. So, and then we have this cute little white tail that sticks out here. So it's got a black shoulder and a white, it's like the red-tailed hawk where the, the name of the bird actually makes sense. Black shoulder, white tail, that works for me. And the, um, and, but you see, notice I, I started with whatever is my comfort zone. My comfort zone, I feel a little bit more comfortable starting with a picture. And that's because with, with my dyslexia, it, 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 I, I still sometimes, I feel just, it's, it's harder for me to start with. Wherever you can start, do that. But if you feel fine starting with a, uh, with, 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 with words, do that. If you, but, but if I just leave this as pictures, then that's actually going to hurt me. So I want to add in some notes. This is black. I'm going to put BK, and this is gray, GY. Um, and it's sitting at top of tree. The minute I start adding words in with this, my um, it, it becomes a much more interesting page. I'm going to add, because I've got kind of gray paper here, I'm going to make my chest here, my head white, add some white into that tail. That's fun. If you have white paper, I mean, uh, then you can't really do this. But if you have gray paper, which is a kind of fun thing to do, then you can get away with just having a little white pencil with you. And you get a big kind of punch out of that by just adding a little bit of um, a little bit of white to the white parts of whatever you're looking at. But notice I've got words, I've got pictures. What do I have? Words and pictures, what am I missing? Oh yeah, I, maybe I should. Well, there's there are five of these in the trees. And so um, maybe I can just sort of make a little, you know, sketch. There's kind of some trees out there and they sort of, I'm seeing some distant, distant trees. Is that a pretty drawing of trees? No, it's not. Um, I'm going to, how can I tell that these are trees? Because I'm going to draw a line to it, and it's going to say distant trees, <laughs> right? And now all of a sudden, these are trees, words and pictures, labels. It makes this, I can convey a whole bunch of information. And then there are two of these birds over here, and then the others are over in here. So there are two together, and three. Huh. Um, so I'm going to note that the birds are sitting in groups. So this could be just chance. Um, are they social? So five birds. Um, or is this just where there were good perches? I don't know, but I've made an observation here and I've diagrammed where they are. A great way of thinking about this is to think about making a diagram instead of I have to make this portrait or a landscape drawing. I just made a little diagram of these clumps of these distant trees showing that these birds were sitting in little groups. There's two over here, there's three over here. And now I'm asking questions about what I see. I've noticed, all right? 
they kind of look like galls. They look like look like galls from a distance. So that's a little it reminds me of. Um, so why do why do gulls and kites share color pattern? Color and pattern. Huh, never wondered that before. So these have gray on their back, they've got white on their tummy and white on their head, white on their tail. Huh, that's very similar to gulls. So what I'm doing is any question that comes to me, um, I can use my, uh, my journal to, to get those, 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 those observations down. So I've got an it reminds me of, I have uh, questions, I have observations, I've got pictures, I've got numbers, I've got words. This is how we sort of see all these pieces coming together. If I particularly like this question and want to follow up on it, sometimes what I will do is I'll add a big question mark next to that. And that's just to remind me, this is something I might want to follow up on. I want to follow up on that. I'm going to leave this question mark white and gray, like my white and gray bird. Hmm. Why is it that they both have white on top, gray, and white here? It doesn't matter who, which one they are. They both have that same pattern. I wonder what other birds I find that pattern on. All right, so there's our, our general pattern. For, for, for gall and kite. If I go out in the field and I see a bird that I've never seen before, everybody gets excited. It's a lifer bird. If there's a rare bird, you'll find people sort of showing up from ever to, from ever to look at it. But what happens is after people have been birding for a while, they'll say, I've already seen the kite. So I... <clears throat> I, I don't really need to pay attention to it because I've got the kite already. But here's the danger with that, is that just because we've seen something before doesn't mean we've, we've, we've really, um, that there's, there's nothing more that we can learn from that. So if you can come up with a question that you've never asked before or an observation that you've never made before, these journal pages are the way to go. Um, if you, so it's not just, can I notice a, a, a bird that I've never seen before, see a new life bird? Um, can I, on the other hand, make an observation that I've never, never made before? Then I can actually get that same sort of dopamine hit of like, wow, something really new and novel for me. So these birds are bopping around. If the bird is moving, so here's a slightly different pose, eh, sort of similar, but slightly different. Um, what I can do is, is I will sometimes then do a little kind of quick sketch of this other pose. Right. So I start to draw this one. It's a little bit sort of steeper, big comma in here. And let's say this one then turns its head and it's looking straight at me. What I will often do then is just start a new little drawing off on the side. Like here is, here's its head. Here are these, 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 fiery eyes kind of looking at me. Ooh, that's cool. Then it moves its head back the other way. And then I'm going to, to you know, then there's my kind of side. I need to sort of have these little dark masks around their eyes. So there's the front. So I'll often make, not just think of this as, um, as, as, as making one portrait of something. I'll often make multiple drawings of the same thing. 
that's far away and I can't really see any details, then I'd make a drawing that's much less detailed. So the amount of, of information that I have really depends on how cooperative this bird is being and, um, and what I can get down. So now I'm, I'm going to start walking, walking along. And I, I noticed that there's, oh, there's a, there's a group of um, sparrows in the road. And they're little birds and they're moving around really quickly. And I can identify there's some white crowned sparrows and some golden crowned sparrows. If they're moving too fast for me to get a sketch of them, then what I can do is I can just write in my notes here, there's there, there are white crowned sparrows, I'm just going to abbreviate them, and there are some golden crown, golden crown sparrows, and oh, look over there, there's a black Phoebe. Um, and there's one black Phoebe, and there were one, two, three, four, five, oh, now six, golden crown, white crown sparrows, and there were about ten golden crown sparrows. So I can keep I can keep tallies of the numbers of things that I see. That's that's a lot of fun. Um, I'll show you another kind of fun way of keeping tallies. Um, let's say oh well, let's, let's put uh, the white tailed kite in here. So I could do regular tally marks. But another fun way to do this is it's a dot grid. Let's pretend that just for a moment. Um, well, actually, no. A group of gulls fly over. There's gulls, and they. I'm having a. I'm going to strike gulls, because it's hard to tell them apart, and I couldn't identify these ones. They're probably western, but maybe they're not. So, um, but there were, there were a bunch of them. So I'm going to try to just get. There were five of these. One, two, three, four, five. So tally marks are one way of counting things. Here's an even cooler way. Check this out. So if you want to put tallies into your journal, it's the dot line method. And with these, you get these every five, you get these sort of blotches of things. But with the dot line method, it doesn't take up as much space and it actually ends up being easier to read. So check this out. First one, I see one gall, I put a dot. Two galls, I put another dot. Oh, you know where this is going, three galls. Four goals. So the first four goals are dots. And then I see another goal. Nope, I'm not going to put in another dot. I put in a line. One line. Next goal, another line. Next goal, another line. Next goal, another line. Next goal, another line. And next goal, another line. So every 10 goals is a box with an X through it. If I see two more goals, I do that. I say, oh no, that actually is about 10 more galls. I do this. If it was 12 more galls, I'd do this. So it's easy for me to scan this and go, oh, 32. When you have a whole bunch of tally marks, then you know this is like eh, messy. But look at how cool this is, this dot x method. And when you're putting in your um, your lines. It doesn't have to be an order to it. There's one, two. It's okay if you do this one next. It's okay if you do this one next. But then once you've got a box, you do your X. That just ends up being a really fast, useful way of recording numbers in our nature journal. Just to remember, numbers are a big part of how we can record information about what we see. It's fun. Oh, I love these birds. All right, so if things are moving around, Again, just you can make little fast pictures of, like, let's say the wind came up and it did this. All right. Let, look at this. This is not going to be a pretty picture. All right. I'm going to say wind. And all right. 
So I've just made a little shape there. That doesn't have to be you know, this full detailed thing here. I got a little bit of information and I put that down in there. I also made a little arrow. If you're making diagrams, arrows, oh, they really help you communicate a ton of, 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 of information. So this is, you know, by, by getting, you know, just a little moment like this, this is something that's interesting, but it's, it's also, um, it's, it's also easy to forget. But if I just make a little observation and I drop that into the book, that's great. So um, that then gets me thinking about more questions. This one here, um, so why not perch out of wind? Huh. So it crouched when they did this, and then that makes me think of this next question. And that makes me think, like, are they spotting um, prey from perch? I've seen some birds do that, like red-shouldered hawks. They'll sit on the wire. They'll sit on a, on a wire, and they'll be up there on a wire. And if you look, their heads are looking down. And, and then they see something, and they'll come zap down, and they'll get that. Huh, that's cool. Are these doing the same? Um, um, seem to hunt from flight. So, but what I seem to be actually observing with these guys is I'm going to make a little storyboard over here. And I'm going to say that like here is here's here's these trees. And and I'm going to sit here with my friends. So they start perched. If they were hunting from here, you'd expect them to then fly zap right down into the grass. But but on these, as I watch them, they then go up and they do this 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 flying thing. So they 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 have their tail fanned, and then the wings are coming up, and and the wings are kind of flapping out there. And I'm gonna go flap, flap, and it's a hover. Really looks white in flight. So it goes from here to this, and then from there, it puts its wings up, and here it is, and, and it drops down into the grass. See, I'm making another little diagram, another little diagram. That's not a pretty picture of a bird in flight, but it stuck its wings up. And then it dropped down right into the grass. And that's different than what I would expect if, if they were spotting prey from the perch. So I'm going to say, yeah, they seem to have from flight. Yeah, this 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 seems to be what the action is instead of this spot from so why are they up there what's going why not perch out of the wind if you're going to come back and just to kind of hang out why be up there on the top of the tree it makes them easier for me to spot so you see what's going on here is that this is this i'm because i'm getting observations down on paper i am um, this becomes a document of all of my thought processes. The observations that I make, little things can then lead to little things. And I'm also starting to figure stuff out about these birds. And it's not about whether I get one picture that is a pretty portrait of this bird. More important than this is the process of paying attention 
to the place that I'm in and, and all the wonders that therein lie. Um, <clears throat> before I leave, I'm going to just kind of reflect here. This is more kind of scientific observations. Um, and I want to just pause a moment before I hop back into the car and maybe um, head up the, the, the road to, 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 to get a burger at the pub. Um, I'm going to just, I'm, I'm going to think about this. And this has kind of been an interesting day. So lots of birds out. It's this really gray, foggy day. But I'm seeing all of this, um, these, these, these wonderful, these wonderful white birds doing interesting things. Um, I'm going to just make a few notes about how I feel about the day. And um, it's going to be so cold, gloomy morning made bright by white birds hunting and living life. I shall do so too. So I can also include in this my own personal thoughts and experiences. As we kind of play in nature, the, the opportunity, it's an invitation to step outside of our own minds and our own lives but we can also then bring our feelings back into it. Paying attention to the world around us makes us larger, makes us bigger, makes our experience of being alive on this earth so much of a richer experience. And I want to just invite you to let, to consider bringing a notebook with you as you're going uh, rambling around on coast side trails. The, uh, the, the more that we pay attention, the more we'll see, the more we'll remember, the more we will connect with the place. As you do that, you're going to fall more deeply in love with these special places. Think about you know, your childhood and the places where you, you really knew these places. Those are places that they change us. And the more we pay attention, the more we let the natural places around us change them, change us. And then we can move into a community of other stewards, of people who love these places, who are working to protect them, and join with them. That could be just a trash cleanup. That could be funding saving the next ranch. That could be um, getting involved as an as invasive plant steward. Um, there are lots of ways to connect with nature near you. And um, it starts with it, the act of deliberate attention. So I hope some of these strategies have been fun. Um, I understand there's some questions in our, that have been sent to our, our, our moderators. Um, or did we forget to ask for those? <laughs> We've got some questions for sure. We've got a lot right. of and If other people get more questions, then you can drop those into the chat. Right now, this is going to bounce into our Q&A session. We have a few questions that are, before we dive into questions, thank you. And I think from what I'm hearing are a number of people just saying thank you um, in our Q&A section, this idea of, of deliberately focusing our attention and with a purpose that this isn't, you know, this is there, we can have a lot of fun with this, but the importance of, of paying attention and connection in, and asking questions, right? Aren't these essential, essential to preservation and our connection to that, but also just to being human on this earth, right? <laughs> so deep, so deep. 
Um, we have a couple of questions that are related to, I just want to give this to you so we make sure we time ourselves. Um, a couple of more um, material oriented questions, and then a couple of questions, including a couple I have <laughs> um, mm -hmm. in terms of um, process. So I'll start with, because this one I think is more simple uh, or, or straightforward or some of the materials. Someone was asking about, were you using a purple pencil? And, and I think just sort of general questions about when you're going out in the field, the materials that you're carrying, like big picture or, and, or, you know, the smaller picture, you're just going out for a, a hike with your family. Yeah, well, um, I, I've gotten both my daughters really into nature journaling. <laughs> So when we go out, we all have a little bag over our shoulder. Actually, there's my bag, right? Um, and the uh, and so we will we can do journaling together. Um, the the stuff that you need to do this is really really straightforward. You just need a little notebook. It doesn't have to be gray paper. I like gray paper because then you can then put white pencil on gray paper. And that's fine because it was gray paper, but now it's gray paper with white pencil on it. Oh, right. And the um, so the easiest little system is just a pencil and a little notebook. Mm -hmm. And I find notebooks are better um, than say some pieces of paper on a clipboard because the notebook then allows you to archive your observations. Mm -hmm. and you can later on go back and look at that. So what I want to encourage people to do if you want to get started on this, first of all, you probably have a notebook sitting around your house somewhere. And that's a great start. But getting one that just sort of feels feels good in your hands that you like. Some things are really small. Let's see, do I have yeah, like, like if you've got you've got a really tiny little book, it's hard to put your notes in it because you get half of a note down and you have to turn the page and imagine writing you know, war and peace on a little notebook this big. It would be hard. Like, it was the best of times. It was the worst of, you know, you have to keep, you can't, something that's neat about this is that I can have all these ideas together in the same place and then they start bouncing off of each other. And I can see, I can look down on the page and I can see my experience and my thinking process on that day in that place. Um, so bring a book that is as large as you will realistically regularly bring with you and no larger because otherwise you won't bring it. If you don't have it, you don't have it. And, um, but the, uh, so the small things are cool because they're small, but the smalls also constrain your thinking. Okay. So the, the initial tools, really, really simple. Once you kind of have gotten yourself started, I encourage people to get a small set of colored pencils and start to bring those with them. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, there's lots of ways to go. I will often uh, bring watercolors with me in the field, and you know, I've got. Uh, if you you know, you're if you're really into it, then you have a, a. You can start to throw in more supplies. But if you put together a great big kit, and you're not that into it yet, you'll think to yourself, "I'm just going to leave that at home because it's really heavy." Mm -hmm. So you want to keep your system, keep your kit lightweight, keep it accessible, and just start doing it on a regular basis. Another great way to start to kind of get more motivation to do that is to go journaling with other people. So in the San Francisco Bay area, um, pre-pandemic, we had monthly field trips with the Nature Journal Club. Um, we're probably going to be starting those up again. Um, there may be, if you're watching this from a different place, um, there are nature journal clubs all over the world. And if you go to the Wild Wonder Foundation webpage, we now are making a, we've made a map, an interactive map of locations of nature journal clubs. And you can start one in your own area. We can also do this with your family, or you can just kind of go out on your own and do it. But it's often really fun to kind of go geek out with other people. It's not an art contest though. Don't get, don't get art contest on it. Because then it just like locks you down. It all becomes about like, ah, I want to draw a kite that looks really pretty instead of like, that kite's so cool. Right? Mm -hmm. You want to be there instead of like getting angst about a drawing. Carrying your own energy into the whatever the club is. You're, yeah, coming in with 
the understanding that you're going into it for that, even if the person beside you is drawing this super sophisticated guide. Yeah. 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 If, if they've had more experience doing it, if they've had more practice doing it, they're going to be more practiced at doing it. And that's okay because we, and we have to, if you're, if you're new to this, um, you have to, there's a period at the start where you're making marks and they're, they're not really looking that much like whatever critter you're, you're looking at. And that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. And that's where labels are really useful. You just draw a line to it and say that these are birds in the tops of trees. Right. And you're recording information like there, there's this group over here and this group over here. That's an interesting thing about the behavior of these things. And it's not about like, you know, technically, how do I draw a kite? I teach art classes. I teach free art classes every week online free art classes for you if you want to learn more tricks about drawing critters i'm you go to my website johnmirlaws.com and i'm teaching classes on, on how to do these things and anybody can learn to do that if you just start doing it on a regular basis but nature journaling again it's not about these pretty pictures the pictures are a tool in service of being in the presence of this wonderful kite mm -hmm. and being in in a place where you are, you're in nature and you're aware, you're alert, you're paying attention, you're wondering, you're curious, you're exploring. You want to get yourself in that wonderful, wonderful mindset. Mm -hmm. And the, um, but, but you can, if you start thinking, I have to make pretty pictures and I am now in competition with this other person who's had more experience. Oh, I don't like losing. This isn't fun. Then I want to help just help people reframe it. The goal of it is to be alive and to pay attention and to make the most of this incredible opportunity that you have to be a sentient being on this planet. Mm -hmm. And, and what can we observe? What can we appreciate? Mm. Um, with that, you know, and, and to further that conversation of materials, we'll be meeting with uh, John Miralaz after. So maybe I'll get a couple of specifics, favorite colored pencils and things, but we'll oh. Oh, if people, so for specifics, if you go to johnmuirlaws.com, yeah, I have this uh, nature drawing link on it, and there's 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 nature or or, or how I don't. Remember. Well, we'll be sending a follow up email. Right. So all yeah, of I, I've got a list that. of like suggested tools and equipment. Okay, perfect. And but but it's going to be different for everybody. Start small. Mm. Um, on my 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 web page, there is a. Um, I, I do have a tools and materials list, but don't think like I should go out and get everything on this list. Mm -hmm. Think about it like, oh, I like doing that. Maybe I'll try that pencil and just kind of keep it small and like slowly build. And mm -hmm. that's fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Emily, you asked about binoculars and we have a couple of great links um, from the Audubon Society that we'll add on there too in the follow-up email. About and I, I have binocular suggestions if you want. Okay, we'll put the, we'll link those on there too, or, or you can, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I like, these lightweight Pentax Papilio binoculars. I do sell them on my website, but I don't, I don't kind of push them because I sell them. I sell them because I really like them. They're super lightweight. And what's fun about these is I can look at, ooh, hummingbird. Um, I can look at, um, oh, you're so thirsty. <laughs> look at you, look at you. Um, so you can, um, you can look at distant birds, but you can also, I can focus right now, I'm looking at my computer screen with this, oh, I can see the little dots, the red, blue, and green dots on my computer screen. With these, I can focus on something as close as a, a foot and a half away from me. So you can make like ants and spiders and butterflies really, really big. Um, so these binoculars have a very close focusing ability, which for, for me, I think is really, is really fun. I, I like that feature of it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, this is more of a, you know, a facilitation question because you've done this for so long. As an educator, you know, a, a number of people here are, that are, are chiming in here are educators. Lisa Graspelin, if I'm pronouncing your last name is correctly, says, no, no question just to say John Muralaz is a hero to my students and me. And I would agree also to my students. Oh, wait, so so uh, wh whoever that is, um, shoot me a private email and um, we'll surprise your class. I can zoom into your class. And let's, let's, uh, 
uh, if your class has been doing a nature journaling together, um, I'd be happy to do a sort of a, a, a private drop in with you and those kids. And we can just talk a little bit about nature journaling and I'll encourage them and that would be fun. Mm, wonderful. Um, so in terms of in engaging curiosity, do you have specific strategies for inspiring that curiosity? You know, those wonder questions, some of us or some, you know, some students, they so quickly or, or when we're out in the field, some of us so easily can kind of generate questions as we see, and some of us that takes more time and, and a little bit more facilitation. Do you have a strategy? Yeah. For that's, a, that's a great question. It's really important. So what, what I do is I make asking questions a specific goal of what I'm doing. It's so important that it is one of my, it's, I, so I notice, I wonder, it's, the, the, it, it's as important as making observations. I want, because it, it's hard to do. And the more you practice, the better you'll get at it. Mm -hmm. And because for, especially a lot of adults, we've been trained not to ask questions because the kids who get all the rewards are the ones with the answers. Mm -hmm. And you see the same thing, even in like a boardroom, if there's a person who just like keeps asking questions, the person's a nuisance. The person who gets promoted is the person who feigns answers about things that they have no idea about and looks confident, right? And we, we reward these people on, on a regular basis, people who have no idea what they're talking about. But, um, but like, would we vote for a politician if they're like, like they, they said like, that's a really interesting question. I've never really thought about that. Like, and that question makes me think about this and this and this and this. And like, why is it that like when this happens, like you never hear anybody who's trying to look, you know, the role of like, I am the confident, the leader, like people don't do that. But that's, that's critical to making better decisions, being really, really curious, and also honest with yourself about all the stuff that you don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're like, I'm a naturalist, I need to prove to people that I'm a good naturalist. And so but in my journal, what I'm constantly doing is going like, oh my gosh, I don't know that. I don't know that. I don't know that. I wonder about that. I don't really wonder about that. Well, here's a little bit of evidence that bears on that, but that's not a really big piece of evidence. So I'm going to kind of judge sort of the, you know, the degree to which I accept any claim or explanation. I'm going to make that proportionate to the strength of the evidence that I have for that. That ends up being really hard to do, but it's really, really important. So practice. Every time I'm going out nature journaling, I'm practicing asking questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm practicing curiosity. So it's not a trait that some people have or don't have. Mm -hmm. It's a skill that you can get better at by practicing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one way to do that is you can initially use like the who, what, where, when, how, why. So I'm looking at this group of um, uh, of these 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 uh, birds, and I'm wondering, right? You know, where? Okay, where? Where? Where are they on it? Okay, they're in groups. Like that's a where thing, right? Right? They're in little groups over here. Group, group. Why are they in groups? Hmm. Right? So I'm finding the question behind the question. And you notice that what I did when I was playing with those is I wrote down several different possible explanations of why do I think that they are in those perches. Was it just that they randomly kind of happened to be that way? And this isn't something that they typically do, but just today where these things landed, it was like that. Are they drawn to each other socially? Are they... I think um, perhaps we've just lost our presenter. <laughs> this last little bit of, a, of our um, Q&A, and perhaps he will jump right back on, but if not, um, I want to speak to from a number of you in incredible thanks. This will we'll be sharing that with him um, to John Muir Laws for being here today, and to all of you who are here and and learning these. Whether you're learning these for yourself to connect with nature and to connect in a way um, with these open spaces that we so critically need, um, or whether you're an educator and this is part of your life's work is educating and getting kids and our next generation to connect with our natural spaces and with the uh, the the biotic factors the living organisms and then abiotic you know the non-living organisms within our our local ecosystems 
um, we will be sending a follow-up email. And so for those of you who are, um, all of you who are registered, um, you will get to receive that. We'll put a link for that on our website as well so that people can um, can get the information that's there as well. Because there's so such a wealth on uh, John Muir Laws' uh, website. And there's a couple of additional pieces that we're going to, we'll be talking with him about in just a few minutes um, offline. So we will get all that information to you. Um, moving forward, check it out. Check out his website, really, really rich. And also the Wild Wonder Foundation. Uh, uh, John Muir Laws, as we mentioned, has started this foundation and they're offering uh, the different uh, conferences, getting people together to share in this information and to learn from each other and um, educational, but also uh, community oriented. So uh, we will share a link on that as well. Uh, we have a couple of things coming up here with the Coastside Land Trust next month. Um, we will be heading back out to Wavecrest Open Space for a restoration work day. Um, so if you haven't done it before, it's a wonderful way to get just get in there and, and connected. You don't have to have any prior experience. We had little girls with tutus a couple of times ago, and certainly found work for them. So I uh, would love to have you there if, you, if, you're, if you've got the time. And I know that's hard to find sometimes, but you've got the time even to come for a bit of it. Um, that will be uh, in uh, the middle of February and we'll, uh, you can check on the date, I think it's February 11th. Um, so come and join us. Um, we'll be meeting at Smithfield. And then in March, we will be uh, coming back on with another webinar with Stephanie Do Dole, who is um, an entomologist. And she's gonna be talking with us about local invertebrates. I'm really, really excited about that. She's, uh, again, another presentation really uh, designed for a wide range of audience. So come join us for both of those. And we look forward to being in connection. Thank you to those of you who continue to support the work that the Coastside Land Trust is doing. Critical, as you all know, um, and becoming more apparent every day how critically that, how critically important. That is. See, I think we have a bit of a delay, and I know uh, we just shared that we'll be sharing the rest of our information through a follow-up email. No, no, no. And thank you again so, so, so very much. No.